Welcome to the Gems of Motherhood. I'm your host, Sharon Khan. I'm here to connect you with some amazing gems of mothers from all walks of life. Each week, you'll hear interviews as well as resources and actionable tips that you can implement in your daily life to be the best gem God has called you to be. Thanks for walking this journey with me today. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. Now, let's get into episode eight with Ginger Hubbard. Usually, the root of persistence is is, is selfishness of them just wanting what they want and just flat out disobeying. Mm. You know, we may give them certain instructions and they just flat out disobey. Well, the Bible does talk about disobeying. And sometimes with the little kids, like you said, yours is just two and a half. We want to keep our instruction very, very simple mm. when they're that young. And so, um, you know, something very simple when they disobey is just to say, honey, are you obeying or are you disobeying? I am so excited about today's episode. Just a little disclaimer here. This episode was recorded before I received Ginger's latest book. I have her book now and it is amazing. Ginger Hubbard is the best-selling author of Don't Make Me Count to Three, Wise Words for Moms, and I can't believe you just said that. She has been a guest on national television and radio shows such as Focus on the Family, The 700 Club, Family Life Today, and Revive Our Hearts. Welcome to the Gems of Motherhood podcast, Ginger. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank you, Sharon. I'm excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. Ginger, your book, Don't Make Me Count to Three, is awesome. And now you're out with another book. I can't believe you just said that. Seriously, sometimes you do wonder where did what they say come from, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> we so, do. They can say the they can say the darndest thing sometimes, can't they? <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> sometimes and, cute, sometimes embarrassing, sometimes horrible, but then uh, you know, and, a lot of what they say is wonderful. So. Exactly. And sometimes as parents you're like, how do you react to that? You know? There are so many great parenting books out there. What sort of advice are you offering that makes yours different from the others and stand out as unique? Well, as a national speaker, I have listened to parents all over the country express their heartache over their inability to tame the tongues of their children. And they've read the books, they've tried the advice, but they've just kind of remained frustrated because it just seemed that it wasn't working. And so, and I can't believe you just said that. What I do with that book is I expose some of the faulty child training methods, which fail to reach the heart. And then I equip parents with biblical principles. Hmm. And then I provide them for how to implement those scriptures in a practical way. And then I uh, just provide this toolbox that kind of helps moms see how to uh, use these methods in the everyday struggles that their children face. And you're right, there are a lot of really great parenting books out there. Um, I've read many great parenting books. um, And a lot of them have a lot of scriptures in them that are very helpful for parenting. But I have found that few really offer the information that mothers need most, which is how to practically apply those scriptures to the everyday struggles that their children face. So, and I can't believe you just said that. What I do is I really try to help parents move past the frustrations Mm -hmm. of not knowing how to handle those uh, verbal offenses and into a more confident, well-balanced, and biblical approach to raising their kids. Now, when I look around, it seems that children are losing respect for their parents, and parents are losing control of their children. And as a result, America is now facing an epidemic of undisciplined children who have no filter on the things they say. I mean, you you kind of see it. And sometimes, you know, as parents, you're just like... I don't even know what to do anymore, right? How do you think our nation has reached this point in our parenting? Well, Sharon, you know as well as I do that we live in a nation that defies God at every Mm. point, including child training. And it's not that parents don't desire to raise happy, obedient, respectful kids. I would say all parents desire that. But so many parents fail to achieve those results. And Mm -hmm. I really think that reason is twofold. I think that the first problem is that many parents in an attempt to get their children to obey and to show that verbal respect, they have adopted these faulty child training methods which fail to reach the heart. So many parents today have developed this philosophy that if they can get their kids to act right, Mm -hmm. to show verbal respect, to behave, that they're raising them the right way. But there is far more to parenting than getting our children just to act right. Mm -hmm. We want to get them to think right and to be motivated out of that, that love of God, that love of virtue, that love for what is right 
rather than just a fear of punishment. So I really think that failure to reach the heart is the first problem. And then the second problem is that parents are simply not following the instructions in the instruction manual. <laughs> I once heard uh, the Bible, you know, I once heard Roy Lesson I loved his illustration. He, he talked about, um, well, he compared uh, God's instruction for parents to an owner's manual uh, for a new appliance. You know, when you think about it, when you buy a new appliance for your mm -hmm. house, the mm -hmm. manufacturer gives you this instruction manual, tells right. you how to use the appliance, how to keep it in the best working order. And then if, if something goes wrong with your appliance, then the customer's encouraged to contact the manufacturer for repairs. Well, Roy Lesson talks about how it's the same with families. The family was God's idea. He mm -hmm. brought it into being. And in the Bible, he has given us, he's given us instructions for how it operates best. And when we don't know, so often we find ourselves in situations that where even when we read the word of God, sometimes we're still at a loss. We're still confused and we're not sure how Very to handle true. situations with our kids. But God has encouraged us to contact him <laughs> for repairs. And so he tells us in James 1, 5, that when we ask him for wisdom and prayer, that right. he promises is that he will give it to us. Amen to that. I mean, you know, obviously there are so many instructions in the Bible and sometimes as parents, you're like, where do we go? Right. Yep. Uh, and I like what you said, you know, whereby when there's faulty parenting, it, it kind of falls down into failure to reach the heart. I know you touched on that in your book, Don't Make Me Count to Three, mm -hmm. but can you just give me a little bit of example so my listeners can kind of understand what you're talking about? As far as reaching the heart? Yes. Okay. It, it's just, we should never just address the outward behavior. We always want to reach past that outward behavior and really learn to pull out what is going on in the heart. Because if mm -hmm. we can reach the heart and figure out what's going on in the heart, usually that's done through uh, heart probing questions mm -hmm. and helping them really evaluate not just how they're acting, not just what they're saying, but what is going on in the heart that is helping them uh, or, or motivating them to, uh, to disobey to right. verbally disrespect and to do things that they shouldn't do. So we always want to learn how to reach past the outward behavior and pull out what is going on in the heart. Mm. Now, you write in your book that why do they act like that? Is the wrong question to ask <laughs> misbehaving and rude talking children? I mean, what do you mean by it? Well, I'm sure you probably can relate to this, but when my kids were little, I would be just constantly shocked by some of the things that would come out of their mouths. And like a lot of parents, you see parents do this, and I was one of them. I would look at my kids and say, why do you act like that? <laughs> but a closer look at the Word of God, I began to realize that I was asking the wrong question. Mm. Um, in Matthew 12, 34, Jesus explained, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, there's merit to that old saying we've heard for many, many years, what's down in the well comes mm -hmm. up in the bucket. Right. Our sin, it does not begin with our mouths and with our outward actions. It always begins with our hearts. Mm -hmm. The sin that shows up in the words that comes from out of our mouths, that comes from inside us. And it mm -hmm. starts a lot sooner than we might think because King David proclaimed, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So when parents really begin to grasp just the origin of sin and the total depravity of the human nature in general, we no longer question why our children sin. And so I slowly learned to stop asking, why does my child sin? And mm -hmm. instead, I began to ask myself, when my child sins, mm -hmm. how can I point him to the fact that he is a sinner, just like I am, in need of a Savior? How can I really help him understand uh, to live uh, in the transformational power of Christ? Mm -hmm. That's the question that we want to ask. Yeah, I love that. Give me an example of how you would react to that. Okay, well, let's say that, um, well, let's use the example of whining. And whining okay. is a good one because whining is one of those issues that it's actually not directly addressed in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, but we want to get to the, past the outward behavior and figure out what's going on in the heart. Because once you can figure out what's in the heart, then 
God's word is going to address it because God mm-hmm. is not just concerned with the outward behavior, but he is always concerned with the heart. So like my daughter, when she was younger, she really struggled with whining, but I couldn't really find the word whining in scripture. So I thought, well, how do I get to the heart of this? And then how do I actually implement this training and get her to um, do the right thing instead mm-hmm. of whining? And so um, I can definitely relate because she, my daughter, Alex, really struggled with whining big time for the longest time. And I just didn't know how to handle it. And so I started looking, what does God's word say? What is at the root of whining? And the Bible doesn't talk about whining specifically, but the Bible does talk about Mm self-control. And if you think about it with little kids, whining is an issue of self-control. So when Alex would whine, in an attempt to get what she wanted. Well, let's just go through a scenario. This is twice you've kind of asked for like a like a, a practical application thing. Okay. Let's say that she's little and she comes into the kitchen and she asks me for a cup of juice. And instead of asking in a normal voice, she's whining for mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And so I would ask her heart probing questions, something like, honey, something very simple because she was little. She was only like, you know, two, three years old. So I would say something very simple like, honey, are you asking for juice with self-control and maybe she won't answer you know some kids clam up and they may not answer Mm -hmm. I would just answer for her I would just say well honey no you're not God wants you to have self-control even with your voice Mm -hmm. and then to get her to practice to learn how to actually apply what I'm teaching her um, and this is just a little thing that I uh, came up with but it worked very well in our family is I had a little kitchen timer that I kept with me Mm -hmm. and I would say Alex because I love you so much I want to help you get self-control. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set this little kitchen timer for three minutes. Mm -hmm. And when the timer goes off, then you may come back and ask for juice the right way with self-control. So you see, I reproved her for whining. I had her suffer the consequences of having to wait three minutes, which can (laughs) seem like an eternity for a small child. But that helps them also to take a moment to focus on how they're going to say it, think before they speak. Mm. And sometimes we may even have to model that for them. Alex was so in the habit of whining that I actually would have to model what speaking with self-control looked like. So it's okay to do that. It's okay to put the words in their mouth and demonstrate how it's to be done. And then most important, I would have her come back and ask for juice the right way Mm. with her self-controlled voice. So what I'm all that to say, again, is that all behavior is linked to a particular attitude of the heart. And once we can figure out the attitude of the heart, then we can address what is actually going on. And, you know, whining is an interesting one. I know you've probably observed this too, but uh, we were talking about epidemics Mm -hmm. in America. Whining has actually become an epidemic. Kids today, they don't just whine when they want something. So many kids today whine as a general means of communicating. I mean, we see it all just just talking in a whiny voice. Right. And so I found that this same method was really helpful for that. You know, say that say that mom's driving the minivan and the child is strapped in the back seat and he's not necessarily asking for something in a whiny voice. He's just communicating in a right. whiny voice. Yeah. You can say the same thing. Sweetheart, are you talking with your self-controlled voice? No, mm. honey, God wants you to have self-control. And then maybe find some cute little timer. They make all sorts of cute ones or even just use the timer on your phone and let them hold it and say, you know, in three minutes, then you can come back and communicate the right way. And then Sharon, we have those moms that say, well, you don't know my child. My child is really strong willed. My child wouldn't come back and ask for juice the right way after that three minute timer go off or my kid, my kid in the back seat wouldn't start communicating the right way after three minutes. They would just clam up and not say anything because they're stubborn. Well, natural consequences. You right. don't get that juice. Right. You don't get to have that conversation with mom until you're willing to have self-control. So right. it's just a, a logical way to impl- teach them how to really apply what you're, what you're teaching them. Yeah. I love the timer concept. I've tried that with my daughter, my daughter who is two and a half years old. And you know, you said three minutes, I've set the timer for 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, I would tell her, okay, mommy is going to set the timer on the phone. And when it goes, then you come back, but she'll keep coming back. And I'm like, it hasn't rang yet. (laughs) Right, right. And maybe, maybe for two and a half, 10 minutes might be a little bit too long. You know, know. sometimes we have a tendency and I'm not saying that it is, but, but maybe that might help if she didn't have to wait quite as long. The purpose is not really how long we're having them wait. The whole purpose is just for them to have that small break Mm -hmm. and then require them to come back and do it the right way. Yeah. And you encourage that the Bible is a 
best instruction manual for parenting. What about verbal offenses that are not directly addressed in the Bible? You know, I mean, you talked about whining. Uh, how about like when kids are just being really persistent? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, toddlers can be persistent. And I've had moms who had issues with their kids whereby giving them um, the iPad for a screen time. And then they, when they take it away, they throw a tantrum. Right. You know, um, how do we address those situations? How do we implement the Bible and instructing them into, into this concept? Um, well, as far as implementing the Bible, again, I think that it goes back to requiring them to practice mm-hmm. that biblical alternative to the sinful behavior. And so, you know, you mentioned um, them being persistent. Usually the root of persistence is, is, is selfishness of them just wanting what they want and just flat out disobeying. Mm-hmm. You know, we may give them certain instructions and they just flat out disobey. Well, the Bible does talk about disobeying. And sometimes with the little kids, like you said, yours is just two and a half. We want to keep our instructions very, very simple Mm. when they're that young. And so, um, you know, something very simple when they disobey is just to say, honey, are you obeying or are you disobeying? And just having them acknowledge that they're disobeying, that helps them to take ownership for the sin that's in their heart. And that's going to help them recognize their need for Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, and then other simple questions that is heart probing might be, um, sweetheart, how did you disobey? Mm. And if they don't answer, maybe answer for them. You know, say you tell your two and a half year old to come to you and they don't obey. Well, sweetie, mom told you to come and you didn't. And that is disobeying. Mm -hmm. And then how and then what I would always say to my kids is, how does God want you to obey? And you said you read my book, Don't Make Me Count to Three. One thing Mm -hmm. that I taught that I've actually read about in a lot of different parenting books um, was I could hold up three fingers when my kids were that little and I could say, how does God want you to obey? And my kids would say all the way, right away and with a happy heart. Mm. And biblically that covers complete obedience. And so, and then again, we don't just want to verbally train. We want to have them come back and do it the right way. Practice that biblical alternative to the sinful behavior, because it's never enough to just verbally instruct our kids in what not to do. We always need to instruct them in what to do. Now, each chapter in your book addresses a different verbal offenses, such as lying, tattling, whining, and complaining. And you offer a very simple three-step plan for dealing with each one. Tell us about that plan a little bit more. Okay. Well, step one, and we've touched on it a little bit here in this interview, is the heart probing questions. Mm -hmm. And where that comes from, and if you think about it, Sharon, in scripture, all the stories in scripture, when someone did something wrong, um, Jesus didn't point his finger in their face and say, this is what you did wrong, and this is what you should have done instead. A lot of times, Jesus would ask heart probing questions. Mm -hmm. And in order for the people to answer those questions, they had to evaluate themselves because Jesus was a skilled heart prober. He knew how to ask those questions in such a way that the people would have to take their focus off of the circumstances and the situations going on around them and onto the sin in their own heart. So step one is heart probing questions. So in every chapter in the book, I offer two or three suggested heart probing questions for each one of those behaviors. Every Mm -hmm. chapter is a different tongue related offense. So chapter one is on whining. Chapter two is on lying. Chapter three is on tattling. And there's 15 different tongue related offenses. So I start out by offering just two or three heart probing questions um, that's going to get the parent going in the right direction to get past that outward behavior and be able to pull out what is going on in the heart. So that's step one. And then in the book of Ephesians, we're instructed to put off our old self and to put on our new self. So step two is to is what to put off. What does God's word say about that particular behavior, like lying and tattling and whining? Mm -hmm. And and what are the what are the consequences if they don't stop those behaviors? What does God's word say about that? And then step three is what to put on, which is how to replace what is wrong with what is right. So that's Mm -hmm. pretty much the three steps in a nutshell. That's awesome. The book just sounds so amazing. Now, after going through these three steps, how can parents get their children to actually implement the principles being taught? 
that, that's where it goes back to requiring them to practice that biblical alternative to the sinful behavior. We just talked about the Ephesians verse that says we're to put off our old self, put on our new self, which mm-hmm. means we are to teach them to put off what is wrong and to put on what is right. So we need mm-hmm. to get them to practice that, not just talk about it with them, but actually have them implement it in their lives. Because when we require our children to physically practice the biblical alternative to the sinful behavior, we're actually teaching them how to apply God's word to daily life. Mm. So let's let's do another example. I, I love doing examples. Let's say that a child speaks disrespectfully mm. to his parent. And, you know, so many parents would, would come back and say something like, that was disrespectful. You shouldn't speak to me like that. Now go to your right. room. But you see, that is ineffective parenting because mm-hmm. the most important part is actually being left out. We shouldn't just rebuke and discipline our children when they speak disrespectfully. We want to have them come back and practice communicating the right way mm-hmm. by using the appropriate words and the appropriate tone of voice. And for many children, particularly mine, as they grew into their teen years, the appropriate facial expression. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you know, we talked a lot about like, you know, reaching the hearts of the young. How about those that are having teenagers, right? Yep. Uh, and obviously, as you know, Christian parents, we try to model to our kids. And as they grow, we hope that they have kind of learned a little bit here and there. But there are so many different seasons as they grow, you know, from toddler to younger kids and to teenage years. How would you apply those principles for, you know, somebody whose parents that are ha- that has teenagers? Right. Well, it depends on what the teenager is doing. <laughs> but, you know, even the one I just talked about being disrespectful, that, that's really why I went there with that one, because a right. lot of what you and I've talked about, like whining and issues like that, uh, tend to usually be the younger kids doing mm-hmm. that. Um, but I would say that speaking disrespectfully to mom and dad is one that the teenagers really struggle with. And so what we don't want to do is just administer consequences. You know, you're grounded for the weekend because you spoke disrespectfully. That's that, that's ineffective because mm-hmm. that's not teaching them how to replace what is wrong with what is right. And unfortunately, that's how many parents parent today. We just tell our kids what they did wrong and then we implement some sort of punishment. But right. that's not training them in righteousness. Mm-hmm. We always want to carry it a, a step further and train them in what to do because that's that's what the Bible means when it tells parents to train their children in righteousness. Never enough to tell them what not to do. We want to tell them what to do and mm-hmm. help them think through it. You know, especially as they become teenagers, they they can think through these issues on their own. So that's, that's really when those heartbroken questions become um, sometimes even more effective because when they're little, a lot of times we have to answer for them, but right. when they're teenagers, you know, they, they've got enough sense about them and enough logical thinking that they can think through some of these issues on their own. So it's just learning how to ask those right kinds of questions, questions. to pull out the issues of the heart. And so that's why in my book, I really start out every chapter um, with a very common, relatable offense. Some are going to be for younger kids. Some are going to be for older kids. And then I really walk through parent-child dialogue. There's a lot of of dialogue in the book. So how Mm -hmm. these conversations can actually play out in the home so that that moms and dads can really learn um, how to not just shake their finger in their kid's face and say, this is what you did wrong and this is what you should have done instead, but to really teach them to mature in their thinking as a Christian and to seek out how the Lord would have them to respond the right way. And then again, you want to actually have them implement what they're learning. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really, really good what you just shared. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes when we teach and discipline our kids at home, may turn out a little bit different when they're outside. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. It it may be, you know, because they might act out differently when they're outside. I'll give you an example. If let's just say, you know, they're behaving well at home and then when you're outside and, you know, sitting in a restaurant and um, they refuse to sit down on their chair and you keep asking them to sit down. I mean, what do you do in those situations? I know I'm just giving you an example because I love examples. (laughs) Sure. sure. When you're so you're saying in that situation when you're out in public. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we do have to be very careful about disciplining our children in public just because mm -hmm. of the time that we live in and people are, are watching and I mean, not that we would do anything wrong, right. but it, things can be, you know, taken the wrong way. And so um, I, I tried to do most of the disciplining at home mm -hmm. um, just because also we don't want to embarrass our kids. You know, when you discipline your kids out in public, that embarrasses them mm -hmm. and that takes their focus off of the sin in their own heart and onto the embarrassment and the humiliation that we really unnecessarily cause them. And that's not our goal. Our goal mm -hmm. is not to embarrass and humiliate our kids. Right. Our, our goal is to bring them to repentance. So if other people are around, I would really encourage, encourage you to go somewhere like they were when we were in a restaurant we had things like that happen too when they were younger and we would try to really practice those at home and be very consistent and disciplined at home. Mm -hmm. But kids are going to, they're going to test the waters. And so, mm -hmm. well, hey, is mom and dad, are they really going to discipline the same way out in public? I might not get away with this at home, but I might can get away with this in this <laughs> restaurant because other people are around. Well, in those situations, I really encourage the parent to um, take the child somewhere that is private. I, there were several times when I was in the grocery store with a full cart of groceries and I literally took the grocery cart up to the front and said, I will be back in 20 minutes. Can you hold this buggy for me? And we went out to the car and we dealt with it in private where, where it's not going to embarrass and humiliate my kids. Mm -hmm. Or there was at one point that we lived really close by and I actually went home. It took 30 minutes and I went home and I handled it. And then I went back to the store. And let me tell you something, Sharon, I only had to do that two times before mm -hmm. my kids realized mom serious here what I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to right. disobey at home and I'm not gonna be able to disobey out in public either and so sometimes we really have to inconvenience ourselves and be consistent um, so that our children learn the law of the harvest that you reap what you sow whether you're at home or whether you're out in public mm, I love it I, I I just uh love all the gem nuggets that you've just shared I mean we can keep talking and talking about it and I'm so excited for this new book. But before we end this podcast, is there anything else that you would like to share with other gems of mothers out there and where can they find your book? Oh, okay. Yes, they can find my book um, either on my website, which is just gingerhubbard.com, mm -hmm. um, or honestly, they can get a little cheaper on Amazon. I don't make any uh, as much money that way, but that's okay. Um, I know that a lot of moms have Amazon Prime, so you get free shipping there. I can't offer free shipping because I don't get free shipping. Um, <laughs> so if they, I'd love for them to get it off my website, but if they would like to save some money, they could always get it off Amazon. And with Amazon Prime, you get free shipping. So all of our resources are available there or on my website. And yeah, Yes, let me just say one final word of encouragement. Um, I know that it sounds like that I have, uh, or it may come across like that I have all of the answers here and that I always did everything perfectly and my kids always responded perfectly. And that is just so not the case. Um, there were many times that I blew it really bad with my kids, even though I knew better because I did read the Bible and I did read all the good parenting books, but there were still times that I really blew it with my kids and, and I didn't respond the way that I should. And so, and I would just encourage moms, because some moms may be listening to this and think, oh my goodness, I've already blown it. I've completely <laughs> blown it with my kids. It's too late. And it's just not. It's totally, it's <laughs> never too late. And, and let me tell you, some of the times that I blew it with my kids, when I was willing to humble myself and go to them and ask their forgiveness, mm -hmm. man, God's grace came down. And, it, and what that did also is it, um, it modeled for them mm -hmm. what it looks like to have God in our lives lives and to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the right way. And so there were many times that I had to go to my kids and say something like, you know, sweetie, the way that I just spoke to you, it did not show respect for you and it did not honor God. Mm. Will you please forgive me for that. And then I would say, let me try that again in a way that does show respect for you and does honor God. And mm. so I would put off my sinful way of parenting in that moment and I would put on the right way. And my kids always responded so well. When we humble ourselves and admit our faults, it really encourages our kids to do the same. Mm. 
so that mm. and we can become weary let me say one more word of encouragement we can become very weary in training yeah. our kids in some of these principles especially right. things like whining and disobeying and some of the things that they struggle with over and over again we can become weary in having to train them over and over again in some mm -hmm. of these same principles um, because it's not overnight it's not overnight fixes it's being consistent and diligent mm. to instill the word of God into their hearts but my favorite verse in those seasons when, when I would become weary is Galatians 6 9 and that verse says let us not become weary mm -hmm. in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we Amen. do not give up that was my Amen. life verse for parenting Oh, that is awesome. Thank you so much, Ginger, for coming on the show. I love, love, love your your book. Don't make me count to three. Can't wait for this. And, you know, um, for all of you out there, visit gingerhubbard.com where you can support and get your book. Thank you again, Ginger, so much for coming on to the Gems of Motherhood podcast. Thank you, Sharon. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you. Now, if you're wanting to connect more with some amazing Gems of Mothers and more resources, head over to gemsofmotherhood.com where you can subscribe to the show. That's where you'll find show notes with actionable tips and any links mentioned by our guest. More importantly, I hope you will find inspiration and learn to cultivate your own journey. You are loved. You're an incredible gem to God. He knows you intimately. He knows what you're going through and he knows what you need. Remember, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in him. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.